there is a small boat out on the sea that separates and unites us. The sea has its own song pulled by rhythm of moon above our earth. There is a small boat far from land. Its sails open to the unseen winds of the spirit. We surrender to the wind. There is a small boat out on the sea beyond maps, and there is bravery. Kia noho a hihuaki a toto. God be with you. Hold hands, people of God, in love. We light this candle to remind us of the light of God's love, the warmth of God's welcome, and our faith in the other presence of God. So, together we say, welcome to our place, welcome to worship, welcome in the name of our living God. Amen. The first hymn this morning is for the man and for the woman, which among other things celebrates art and culture and human creativity. I'll read the first verse and then Colin will start off. For the man and for the woman, for the body and the soul, for the mind and for the spirit, for the love that makes us whole, for the person and the people, for the many and the few, for tradition and for custom, for the fresh and for the new. From Prayers for a Planetary Pilgrim by Edward Hayes. Remind me ten times and more 
of all that you have forgiven me. Without even waiting for my sorrow, the very instant that I slipped and sinned. Remind me 10,000 times, Anmar, of your endless absolution. Not even sorrow required on my part, so brought the bounty of your love. Yes, I can. I will forgive as you have forgiven me. You, O oh God, are my rock and my refuge. You are the stronghold of my life. You are my hope. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. From my mother's womb you have claimed me. Now I am older and gray-headed. You are still with me. Through the journey of my life you have been there. Together we have done marvelous things in times of hardship and oppression. We endured many trials. In times of gladness and joy, we stand of our love. Our good times cannot be numbered. When the earth one day reclaims me and I lie in its depths, you will be there with me. You shall exalt and comfort me. And since I am made of you, you will raise me. Amen. Now, normally, at a moment like this, we have some theology or poetry or spiritual reading. Uh, you have to make do with me today. I've called this of water, stars, and us. And I'm thinking, what kind of reflection can I add over the season of creation about the natural world, the universe, and our place in it? So this is my first attempt. The source of the liquid water, water has, that has sustained our seas and nourished life in our world for centuries has been the subject of serious scientific debate. Some researchers have argued that water has been present in our world in one form or another since it was formed from swirling clouds of dust and gas 4.5 billion years ago. In short, the Earth always came with its own reservoir. However, other scientists take a different point of view. They say that in the beginning, the earth was scorched and waterless, and our oceans appeared much later, when ice and water hit our world from extraterrestrial sources. And now, a group of British scientists have provided key support for the idea that the origins of our seas were out of this world, I won't try and explain the science. I spent a lot of time with Scientific American. I didn't really understand it myself. But it seems as if at least half the water on Earth, half the water in this glass, originated in space. How does that make you feel? One answer might be insignificant tiny even. It does us no harm to realize we are not the center of the universe. But beyond that, there is a possibility of wonder, the possibility of awe at the world, word of the creation of which we are a part. Let us sit with the wonder, the mystery of this. We see ourselves amidst the creation with humility and awe. We come and we go in a brief moment. Yet the very elements we are formed of were forged in the stars themselves. We resolve to live with mindfulness and humility and to care for the warp and weave of creation of which we are but one part. Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Holy One, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and forever. Amen. Our second hymn is Great and Deep the Spirit's Purpose, and again I'll read the first verse before we sing. Great and deep the Spirit's purpose, hidden now in mystery, nature bursts with joyful promise, ripe with what is yet to be. In a wealth of rich invention, Still the work of art unfolds. Barely have we seen, and faintly, what God's great salvation holds. Normally, this is the bit where I tell a story. Today, I tell our story. I'll hand over to Cam in a moment, but I'd like to begin with our, our celebration of this book, 
those people who, who prepared this book, and the gifts that we remember and celebrate. It is fair to say that Methodism, while having a wonderful musical heritage, is not known for visual arts. For painting, stained glass, ceramics, or sculpture. The plainness of some of our places of worship can be aesthetically pleasing. Yet sometimes there is a disregard for aesthetics, almost to the cultivation of ugly as a kind of virtue. Not here, though. I've often come into the space with visitors who are taken aback by its peacefulness, composure, and beauty. And how our tundra, our gifts, our heritage tell our story and add their beauty, art, and dignity to this space. Ministers come and go. But the places we serve, the gifts that dignify those places, continue. That unfolding story we celebrate today. For that heritage, we give thanks. Today we receive another treasure. We give thanks for it. We celebrate the hard work that has gone into it. So Leah, Sharon, Margaret, I thank you. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, I have to go more or less straight away, so I won't be there for more morning tea with you. But I thank you. And now, Karen will come and speak, and thank you for all of us. This is a bit of a... If I said, I will, Mary. Just do wait. Just relax. Sorry. I've just written a few words like um, David. So today we're privileged to see a project which has taken much time and effort by a few church members and their, f and their families to complete. Some time ago, it was, a suggestion was made to the leaders meeting, which is the group that sort of make decisions about the church, to have a physical record of the provenance of the very numerous treasured items which are part of this church and are here in the building today. And some of them are around us, and the ladies have made a s display here, which I hope you'll have a look at when once the service is finished. This information would be consolidated into a book, which will be available to all, and that's why we, I'm here. The, the, me meetings, the meeting's members agreed, and a request was made to our generous and knowledgeable church historians Leah and Margaret, to research and compile the po proposed volume. And today, with these two, with the assistance of Greg, who unfortunately is not here, who looked after the, photograph the photography, and from Sharon, who luckily for us is here, with her design and layout skills, this fine publication has resulted, and David's demonstrated it to you. The book's title, title brings with, begins with the te reo word toonga, tonga which the Te Aki Māori definition defines as anything highly prized. Today I acknowledge the four highly prized contributors who gave their time and their skills to this publication. So um, Leah and Margaret and Sharon, if you'd like to come forward, we've got a seat here for you. And we'd like you to come forward and accept some acknowledgement of the efforts that, from the church of your, that you put into this publication. It is a very significant contribution recording the history of the church that we all worship in. And again, we thank you very much. So if we could have the three ladies come up here. And Mary, if you could come and do your piece.
remind you of the day. And you'll probably plan them later. So to Leah, who's, who's a writer in historic, historical researcher extraordinaire, I would say. <laughs> and to Margaret, who, who ferreted out all the back stories of everything. You know, the, the stories behind the stories, <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. And to Sharon, who's really a design skill expert, who just put the final touches to everything. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's not me, it's these things. <laughs> Let's pray. We give thanks for the blessing of being in this place, for the beauty and art which grace us here. Lift our hearts and challenge our imaginations. We give thanks for today's celebration and the work we honor and celebrate today. Let us rejoice celebrate and give thanks. Amen. George is our reader today. The first reading from the scriptures is taken from Jeremiah 18. 1 to 11. Some of you may know Jeremiah in his portrait, portrait by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel in Rome where he is shown as a rather muscular and burly figure. But Jeremiah seemed to be a man most of the time full of fear but out of his fear you hear the brave words that he spoke against his enemies. The reading today is prefaced with stern warnings about keeping the Sabbath. If the people of Judea and Jerusalem obey, they would be happy and prosper. 
if they turned away, the Lord would punish them and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And this, is, this reading is appropriately headed, Je Jeremiah at the potter's house. The Lord said to me, go down to the potter's house where I will give you my message. So I went there and saw the potter working with his wheel. Whenever a piece of pottery turned out to be imperfect, he would take the clay, break it up, and make it into something else. Then the Lord said to me, Haven't I the right to do with you people of Israel what the potter did with the clay? You are in my hands just as the clay is in the potter's hands. If at any time I say I am going to uproot, break down, or destroy any nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns from its evil, and then I would not do what I said I would do to them. On the other hand, if I say I'm going to plant or build up a nation or kingdom, but then that nation disobeys me and does evil, I do not do what I said I would. Now then, tell the people of Judah and Jerusalem that I am making plans against them and am getting ready to punish them. Tell them to stop living sinful lives, to change their ways and, to do, and the things that they are presently doing. The reading from Luke is Luke 14, 25 to 33. And it is about the sacrifices of being a disciple of Christ. Where Christ makes a parallel with what happens to the plans of a tower builder or a king who is planning a battle. Once when large crowds of people were going along with Jesus, he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me cannot be my, my disciple unless he, sorry, unless he loves me more than he loves his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brother and his sisters, and himself as well. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If one of you is planning to build a tower, he sits down first and works out what it will cost to see if he has enough money to finish the job. If he doesn't, he will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation, and all will see what happened and laugh at him. This man began to build, but cannot finish a job they will say. If a king goes out with 10,000 men to fight against another king who comes against him with 20,000 men, he will sit down first and decide if he is strong enough to face the other king. If he is, he will send messengers to meet the other king and ask for terms for peace while he is away off. In the same way, concluded Jesus, None of you can be my disciple unless he gives up everything he has. Who are we without our stuff? We are citizens and residents of Aotearoa, New Zealand, yes. But we seem to exercise our rights as consumer more often than our rights as citizens. Perhaps it isn't quite as mocked here as in the US. Back in the 90s, some people there wanted to put some sort of break, some sort of limit on consumerism, and organize an annual Spend Nothing Day an initiative President Clinton declined to endorse. Consumerism might not be so big a thing here, but we do consume 
don't we? You might have had the experience I've had a few times in recent months of going shopping. And whether because of a shortage of lorry drivers caused by COVID or the flu, or by disruptions to transport due to the winter weather, there are gaps on the shelves. Your marmalade, your cereal, your coffee isn't there. You register this flicker of annoyance and think, what will I do? Do I buy something else here? Or do I drive across town and try the other shop, the one I normally don't go to? Beyond our breakfast tables, we perhaps have other defining consumer choices, Ford or Holden, Air New Zealand or Jetstar, Apple or Samsung. It is our human nature, it seems. What happens, though, when our brands, our choices, are taken away? And surely, it's a more serious matter when family is taken away. Our gospel reading has those troubling renunciations. The one that preachers will steer well clear of if they can. After all, telling would-be followers to shun, and even though not in the translation we heard today, to hate their families, is the kind of thing we associate with cult leaders who try and isolate devotees from family and friends in order to exercise control. What we hear today are certainly uncomfortable and disconcerting words. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. The first two are renunciations of family and of life. The third is renunciation of possessions. So therefore, None of you can become my disciples if you do not give up your possessions. So, where to begin? When preaching on this passage, I generally did back to my Hebrew major and talk about rabbinical hyperbole, that this is a preaching device employed by rabbis using extreme, ridiculous examples, which make you shake your head, which wake you wake up and think. I think this passage is in that tradition. After all, then and there, to be without the connections and support of being in family was to be in a position of risk, possibly even the risk of not surviving. See how shocking, how ridiculous Jesus' words here were. So few. That's all right, then. We have disarmed the text like an old bomb. We have tamed it. We can put it to one side and move on. Well... Not quite. Is this a path each of us are called to follow? Is faithfulness necessarily marked by rupture with the past and all that defines us? Well, no. But being faithful defines us in new ways. It gives us a truth to live by. It sets our lives in a particular orbit. Our lives are different because they cross the path of a life of Jesus. Today is a day when we celebrate heritage and what has been gifted to us over time. Today is a day to celebrate that heritage and to affirm legacy and connection. Today is a day to affirm the gift, the blessing of it. But are we held captive by it? Is our past more important than our future? I think I hear a resounding no. Heritage can for some be a trap. Do you remember the Waldens? I'm sure you're old enough to remember. The TV series about an American family during the Depression. Two of the characters were a pair of spinster sisters, Mamie and Emily Baldwin. They were well off at a time when most people were struggling to get by. But their lives were about conserving the past, be it family history and genealogy, their father's recipe for moonshine, which I seem to recall being very popular, or the memory of a fleeting and lost love. Life for them was a constant gaze over, over the shoulder at what had been. 
sometimes the past seems comforting and safe. It is a place of certainty and established truths. A place where things are as they should be. Or so the filter of selective memory tells us. The present is messy. The present is masked in church. The present is lower numbers or even lower numbers. The present is an unsatisfactory muddling through. The future, well, let's not go there. And it's not just about church, is it? We face a challenged economy and a polarized society. We are confronted by the specter of war. And of course, we face climate change, the extinction of species and environmental degradation only this week, of course, the terrible floods in Pakistan, which have washed away much of that nation's fertile soil. But here's the thing. The future is coming, like it or not. And as we contemplate it, we're called to do so not with dread or resignation, but with engagement and hope. Like a clay on the potter's wheel, we are shaped, reshaped, and shaped again. Oh yes, our first reading. Do I believe we are being punished by being discarded like a pot that didn't turn out quite right, like, like every attempt at pottery? Well, no. I do believe, though, that rather like a lump of wet clay, we, our world, and our collective future can be shaped in a range of ways. Like a lump of clay, our fate, or the fate of the world itself, is not predetermined. It emerges in time, a collaboration between clay and artist. We are the clay. We are the artist. We are being formed, and we are forming. We are the gift, and we are the giver. Today, we give thanks for the richness of our past, for the legacy which enriches our presence, and the wisdom and energy involved. We will honor that inheritance as we face our future here. Likewise, too, we face our future in an uncertain, fragile, and changing world. And we do so with hope. Amen. Our next hymn is an early Quaker song called How Can I Keep From Singing. I'll read the first verse. My life flows on in endless song of earth's lamentations. I hear the real, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing?
Let us pray. That we pray thankful for this day, for the cause of our celebration, for the gifts and stories which unite us in a sense of place here. We pray thankful for how our spirits are uplifted here by the memories and connections being here stir in us. We pray thankful for this season of creation. We are, of course, challenged and aware by the crises our planet faces. But we celebrate this beautiful, this promising world. We pray for those who will suffer, who are afflicted. We remember particularly this week the people of Pakistan and Sudan, both of whom have faced devastating flooding. We remember around the world, sometimes not particularly well told, there are stories like these. We pray for people in places of conflict. Of course, we continue to remember Ukraine and the tension and fear around the Zaporizhia nuclear plant there. But we remember other places and other stories which have perhaps slipped from our minds in Syria, in Sudan, in Somalia. Let us pray for those we love, those we live alongside, those we share our lives with, so remember those who are sick and facing the prospect of the end of life. We make these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus, very gift of God to our humanity. Amen. We'll now receive our offering. In our giving, we wonder what we can really give to express what we'd like to be, to contribute realistically to good causes, to be identified to a better and bigger humanity, good spirit of life from our smallness, help us to be part of the enlargement of being here and the enlargement of being alive. This is what we would like. This is our prayer. Amen. Jesus was always the guest in the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, Joanna and Susanna and Zacchaeus. He was always the guest at the meal table of the wealthy where he pled the case of the poor. He was always the guest. But here at this table, he is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to want to follow him must be fed by him. And those who will wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished, and this is the table when Christ can make us new. So come, you who are tired and in need of rest. Those of you who are hunger and thirst for deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his table.
We thank you, Holy Creator, that you allow, allow us to live amid such beauty, warmed by spring sunlight, cheered by the reassertion of new life this season. We thank you for the ever-shifting beauty of our city, the sea and the hills of this place, and the ever-restless and changing skies. Thank you too in this place for the beauty which graces our worship, for the human creativity and grace we celebrate today. As Jesus was, we are called to times of service, but also to solitude, to vast stores of unused quiet to be with you, to immensities of rivers, oceans and skies that enlarge our souls, and remind us of our place and the enfolding of creation. And so we come together to wrestle with the angel of your presence, that in doing so we may find a blessing. We say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And now, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose, we fall silent. We remember him who came to live and die as one of us. Setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside, emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands, we yearn for the rest and the healing, the holding and accepting, the forgiving which Christ alone can offer. Merciful God, send now in kindness to your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of our passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread and broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Take this and eat it. And when you do, remember me. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Take it, all of you so that I may be present in your midst. He, who the universe could not contain, is present to us in this bread. He who redeemed us and called us by name now meets us in this cup. So take this bread and wine, in them God comes to us, so that we may come to God. Amen. I invite... Colin and Servers and George Ford, please. Jesus birthed for you. Here's the bread that Jesus birthed for you. Here's the bread that Jesus birthed for you. A cup of blessing for you. A cup of blessing for you. Blessing for you. Here's the cup that Jesus blessed for you. Here's the cup that Jesus blessed for you. Here's the cup that Jesus blessed for you. May the life and the death we have remembered, the meal we have shared, the story we told be graced in truth. 
May they grow in you. May they be your shelter and your peace. Bless them all your days. Amen. Bringing people up in groups of eight. May the story we've told, the meal we have shared, be grace and truth to you. Listen to your days, may it nurture you and give you hope and peace. Amen. May the meal we have shared, the story we gather around, be hope and peace, truth and love, this and all our days. Go in peace. Amen.
consecrated burial. So <laughs> try and make these last. Hello. Blessing for the church. Kept that Jesus blessed for you. And this is the cup that Jesus blessed for you. And this is the cup that Jesus blessed for you. This is the cup that Jesus blessed for you. This is the cup that Jesus blessed for you. This is the cup of blessing for you, Father. Blessing for you, Father. Cup of blessing for you, Father. May be nurtured and fed by this meal, the truth it tells, the one we remember. Go in peace. Amen. Have better neighbours been to communion? Have better neighbours have they been? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. Right. So. We who share the bread of community and the cup of our common dreams lead this table, challenged to be the body of Christ, loving, redeeming, making things whole, challenging to newness. May this come to be. Amen. Our final hymn today is Where the Road Runs Out, and again I'll read the first verse before we sing. Where the road runs out and the signposts end, where we come to the end of today. You, the God of Abraham, for us, send us out upon our way.
together. Mother in God, you give us birth in the bright morning of this world. Creator, source of every birth, you are our wane, our wind, our sun. Mother in Christ, you took our form, offering us your food of light, grain of life, grape of love, your very body for our peace. Mother in spirit, nurturing one in arms of patience, hold us close, so that in faith, we root and grow until we flower, until we know. Glory be to God who made us, and to Christ who loved us, and to the Holy Spirit who keeps us in peace, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Kiato, kiatato, tato, te atafai, o tatato, aniki, o hiu koraiti, me te anha, o te atua, me te tisinga tahitanga. Kite wano tapu, aki aki aki, amine. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.